and we are back. Yeah, we had we had some shuffling to do here. We were, uh, you know that 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 happens when on live radio. Sometimes uh, you got You got to uh, make do with what you have. So right now we 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 got our regularly scheduled guest, Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com, freelance journalist. Uh, to discuss Kit's recent work, which is great, by the way. Um, Thank you. We love having Kit on the show. We love Kit. He's my favorite O'Connell. We were just discussing. <laughs> <laughs> we were just discussing how Kit should create a troll Twitter account named Keck O'Connell, <laughs> where he makes over-the-top alt-right statements. And uh, see how many alt right people he can get to retweet him, believing his bizarre <laughs> tweets. But thank you for coming out. Thanks, it's good to be here. I guess I could, I could probably just take the things that people tweet at me and turn that into the tweets for my evil twin account that we were just inventing. It'd be pretty easy to generate. <laughs> you should do like a weekly article of alt right comments on your on your on your Twitter. <laughs> It'd be kind of repetitive. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny, but uh, yeah, I, I wanted to start off here with this article, flawed but promising. Could the Industrial Hemp Farming Act be key to hemp's future? And this looks like there's a thawing of this anti-hemp U.S. government stance. Is that what's going on right now, Kit? Yeah, I, absolutely. I would agree with that. Um, <clears throat> What's really made the difference, you know, uh, hemp, uh, like all forms of cannabis, was illegal for decades and decades since the war on drugs began. Uh, but uh, in 2014, hemp was legalized uh, in the 2014 Farm Bill for research purposes. And the definition of research in there was very generous, so it included all kinds of growing and even sales of hemp products under the guise of market research to see whether these things sell or not. It which makes sense. If you're going to grow up a crop, you want to know if it's going to be profitable for you as a farmer or not. Um, and it kind of left it up to the states to figure out uh, whether they were going to grow hemp. And 33 states have legalized hemp growing, at least in a limited sense. And about 17, I think, are going to be growing it over the next year or so. Uh, and there's still some, some legal problems around it. But what's been interesting is it's been really successful it's been really successful in some very conservative parts of the United States. Um, so this bill that we're talking about, the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, is coming out of Kentucky. It's basically coming out of old tobacco country. And as tobacco sales have fallen, what we found is that uh, hemp has stepped into the gap for some farmers. And um, some of the most conservative legislators in the country in terms of other issues that you and I might care about are actually becoming extremely supportive of hemp. Uh, and, and that's a really cool sign because it really has bipartisan support. As they say, if it makes dollars, it makes sense. And, you know, the, these politicians are just responding to the economic demand of their constituents. They need to fill that gap where people are quitting smoking. You know, some, something needs to, to, to put more income into those farmers' pockets. And, and it, it looks like, looks like hemp. It, it could be very profitable for them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and, you know, it's better, obviously, because it's like, you know, I mean, tobacco pretty much has only one use, and that's making this, this basically toxic product. Um, and hemp has dozens of uses in terms of all kinds of products it can be made from. It can be extracted into CBD oil, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit, I think. And, uh, you know, you can make it into, into any number of products. Of course, it can even be made into biofuel and plastic. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, it's, it's so, so versatile, but we do need to remove some legal barriers uh, that are still preventing it from being grown freely in the United States. So, so what exactly does this, um, does this bill entail? I mean, what will this open up to people? I mean, is this a nationwide sort of thing, or is it a selective group of, of states, or, or what, what is, what's going on? It, it's a nationwide bill. It's, um, 
you know, so, so basically, yeah, what we do is allow, instead of right now the states are allowed to regulate hemp for these research programs, but under this bill, if it became a law, uh, hemp would explicitly become just a crop like any other crop. Uh, and this is, of course, only under this bill, the industrial side of hemp. So it would have to have low THC, which is the chemical that gets people high. So this isn't legalizing cannabis, as we think of it, or marijuana. It's, it's hemp targeted. Uh, so it's just the industrial hemp, uh, which is low THC and used for fiber and textiles and fuel and CBD oil. Um, and it would take that, it would separate hemp from cannabis in terms of its legal classification as a, as a dangerous drug and instead make hemp be explicitly legal. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it would also even do some other, some other beneficial things like expand the level of THC that could be industrial hemp for research purposes. Um, and basically, it would leave it up to the states to regulate it, just like they, their state agricultural departments and even the, and the government's agricultural department uh, uh, regulate anything. And from what I understand, actually, the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, is probably the most supportive government agency when it comes to hemp. They are eager to get into supporting hemp growers in a big way, and they just need these legal barriers to fall. Now, the flip side of that, unfortunately, is that this bill is really imperfect right now. Um, it just left the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is basically the first step that a bill has to go through. And to get out of committee, they had to agree to take on some really bad amendments, including one that would let the DEA make surprise inspections of hemp farms. And there's just no reason for that. It's a ridiculous thing. If, if, you know, just like any other situation, if the government or law enforcement believes something illegal is going on on a farm, they can get a warrant, just like they do for anywhere else. There's no reason to subject hemp farmers, especially if we're theoretically treating hemp just like any other crop. There's no reason to subject them to that kind of DEA oversight. And there's a couple other little problematic provisions like that in there that were had to be added. Um, the hope now, of course, is that as it goes through the Senate and then as they try to pass a version in the House, that between the two they can make a, a bill that, that it just legalizes hemp without all these weird add-ons. Um, I really want to emphasize that even if this law doesn't happen, even if this doesn't bill happens, it's a sign that we're heading towards hemp legalization. It's really only a matter of time. You know, with the mass cultivation of hemp, we're, I mean, you're going to be cutting into some some other corporate, com, you know, corporate entities' business. You know, whether that be a paper mill or, or whatever. You know, what what sort of corporate uh, pushback is there on this bill, if any? Oh, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, to know for sure, but I would guess that there's some corporate interest involved in some of those, those added on clauses that I mentioned. Um, uh, I, I, th I think we're going to see that kind of pushback and probably their lobbyists are going to lobby against this kind of bill from happening. Um, but, you know, when you've got people like Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell, and, you know, uh, Comer, these are some, some hard-hitting Republicans that are backing hemp. And so I, I think even with the corporate money, it's, all, it's still only a matter of time before we see uh, something that legalizes hemp. Well, that is good to hear. Um, next up is study. Out of 2,400 CBD users, 42% gave up pharmaceutical drugs. And now talk about corporate pushback. I mean, there's got to be a ton on this because this is working. Definitely. And I think that's, you know, that's part of the reason it is so hard to, uh, to fully legalize hemp and CBD oil. Um, you know, for, just like super briefly for, for any of your listeners that don't know, CBD like I was saying, THC is one of the chemicals in, in hemp and cannabis that makes people feel high. And of course, it is a powerful painkiller. But there's this other chemical that works by itself or alongside THC that can work individually or together called CBD. And that does not have, uh, in 99% of people, 99% of times we take it, it does not have any psychological feeling of a high. But people have found that it can help with a whole host of things, with chronic pain, with inflammation, uh, it's been almost a miracle drug for peop some people with epilepsy. Um, and one of the things we are finding, actually, uh, is that the FDA, I'm sure with corporate backing, is pushing back really hard. There's an ongoing legal dispute uh, between the FDA 
and the CBD industry over whether uh, CBD has to be declared as like a, a, a polluted substance. I forget the exact legal documentation, but they consider um, CBD, rather than being a supplement, almost more like a pollutant from the FDA's perspective in a, in a supplement, which obviously it's a beneficial ingredient based on a ton of science. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of pushback. Uh, we also want to watch, you know, moving forward, we want to make sure that, like, CBD and those kinds of things just get legalized and become accessible to people. We don't want what happens instead to be like that the pharmaceutical industry just sort of patent it and make it available for, for a very expensive prescription-only kind of treatment. We want this to be as widely available as possible. But this is a fascinating study. They looked at 2,400 people that were already using CBD. Uh, this was a, a website called HelloMD, which is like a medical cannabis website and a company called Brightfield Group, which is basically a business analysis firm for the cannabis and hemp industry. And, and what they found was that 42% um, of people who use CBD have stopped taking other medications. Uh, that includes both over-the-counter medications and pharmaceuticals. Um, so that's just a really extraordinary figure right there. So I know, I know uh, about Kratom. Kratom has helped a lot of people get off of opiates, Suboxone, heroin, um, you know, a number of other op uh, opiate-related pills. Um, how does CBD oil work with, with uh, people relieving people of that urge to do opiates if they're a, an opiate addict? Oh, we actually have found there, there is some evidence that can help with that. Um, there's a, a, a really well-known and well-respected uh, cannabis researcher named Sue Sisley, and she's done some research into help with addiction as well. as She's part of an ongoing study into cannabis and PTSD. Um, and, and there is definitely some evidence that CBD alone or CBD plus THC can help people with uh, uh, symptoms of withdrawal and kind of that addictive urge. Uh, it, it definitely has a, some, some promising potential there. Um, and it also just seems like it maybe makes, you know, even when people aren't giving up pharmaceutical drugs, you know, because I figure forty-two percent of people gave up drugs. Obviously, that means that you know over half are still using something over the counter or prescription. But even then, a lot of people found out that they can use less of those things. Like if they're on opiates for a chronic pain condition, or you know they take medicine for anxiety, a lot of them found that that you know they can take a lot less of those medications if they're regularly using CBD. It's uh, CBD oil, and it's promising spread throughout the country. I mean, in New York, you can just go down to the local head shop, bong shop, whatever you want to call it, and get uh, and get some CBD oil. It's uh, it's pretty amazing to see how rapidly, you know, uh, cannabis related products have just. I mean, it's like a wildfire that uh, won't be able to be put out. I mean, this this is unstoppable, don't you think, Kit? I think so. There was actually a really interesting case recently where a grocery store, like a you know herbal national grocery store in Indiana, was selling CBD, and the police actually raided it and took their CBD. But then, when the lawyers for the grocery store came in and said, "Hey, you can't do this," the police actually had to give the CBD back and essentially apologize and admit that they'd been wrong to raid over this product. Um, you know, and so that's really extraordinary. It is spreading like wildfire. I think it is unstoppable at this point when you've got 33 states with hemp, and as far as cannabis goes, we're looking at, what, like 25 states or something around that, close to that, that are, are working to legalize psychoactive cannabis in some form. I don't think this genie is going back in the bottle, but we do still, ideally, you know, we are still going to need legislative change. We're going to need Congress to continue to support hemp and cannabis and, and kind of remove those last few barriers because the DEA... And the FDA, they're holding on for dear life. They don't want that budget to go away from prosecuting people for using this plan. So we're going to need to fight, keep fighting as, as people and keep putting pressure on our lawmakers to make it legally possible for us to use these, uh, this plan. What a horrible reason to hold on to the illegality of something. You know, it's just pure greed and, oh, God, ignorance, too. You know. But... Um, and, and, Go on. There's really no other explanation for it, you know, because it's, cause these are safe substances with a pile of scientific evidence showing how much they can help people. Uh, there's really no other reason other than they've got their budget and they don't want to lose it. All right, so, uh, Kit, do you have time for uh, one more article? 
Sure, absolutely. All right, great. Um, I wanted to get into this article because this is really interesting, and it, it really um, uh, runs down uh, uh, a group that um, people aren't familiar with. Um, they're in the news a lot for um, destruction and uh, um, violence. Um, but the, the title of the article is, What is Black Bloc? Why do activists wear masks? And it says, One common misconception is that Antifa, anti-fascists, and Black Bloc are one and the same, or that Black Bloc are all members of a particular activist movement. In reality, Black Bloc is not a movement, but a tactic that has been used by diverse groups and movements over the years. So, I don't know, can we, can we uh, run down what exactly is going on here within, I mean, uh, you know, leftist activist circles, uh, Black Bloc, Antifa, and uh, everything that's going on in that sphere? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's a big topic, and I'm sure we could probably talk for an hour about the whole topic, but, uh, you know, briefly, um, there is just a pile of misconceptions about anti-fascism and about uh, what it means to be Antifa, Antifa, and also just about this black bloc. Um, you know, and black bloc is, is really just any time when people are dressed in these, you know, similar all-black outfits, usually masked up. Um, people might also choose to mask up separate from doing a full black block. They might, like, mask up and wear sort of regular clothes otherwise. Um, and, you know, I want to emphasize that the reason people are doing that, for, you know, it's, it's uh, the biggest thing is protecting their identity. Um, we have, you know, neo-Nazis on the Internet that are trying to, you know, share people's private information um, for coming out to protest, even if they're not participating in acts of, of violence. Uh, just, you know, uh, you know, going after people for being involved in protesting, um, which is kind of ironic given, given that the whole sort of, you know, myth or mis you know, mythology or messaging that the far right is trying to use is that they're all about free speech, but it seems to only be their free speech. And one of the ways they do crack down on leftists is to try to spread their identity and expose them to losing their jobs or to hate or even assault by doing so. Um, you know, anti-fascism, just like Black Bloc isn't a particular movement but a tactic, you know, anti-fascism, Antifa is really just anyone that is out protesting against white supremacy, against neo-Nazis or, or white nationalism. Um, and there is this kind of very coordinated media effort to make Antifa look like this just pure, uncontrolled, wild, uh, immoral agent of violence. And I don't believe that to be true. I'm very concerned about that pushback because... If you talk to actual activists on the ground, we can use Berkeley as an example. There's been a lot of negative media attention about what happened in Berkeley recently, um, trying to imply that anti-fascists and Antifa were uh, unwelcome and just purely violent, when the reality is that they were invited by the community activists that were there to protest this white nationalist rally that was planned to happen in Berkeley. They were welcome there, and they were seen, their actions were seen as, as you know, 99.9% .9 defensive of the left. And that really is one of the major roles of people in Black Bloc, uh, whether they're anti-fascist or not, is a defensive role. Uh, if, if you look online, you can find some footage from the inauguration protest, uh, uh, you know, against Trump's inauguration. And, um, you know, right now there's dozens of people that are facing 70 years or more in prison for being scooped up by the police in an area where Black Bloc were protesting. And while, yes, there were some people in Black Bloc engaged in acts of property destruction, um, one of the major actions of them was also to protect people at the inauguration protest. Uh, there was uh, uh, some people that weren't even necessarily part of the protest that just came out to see what was happening, and the police started indiscriminately pepper spraying the crowd. And they've got those big jugs of, like, super high-pressure uh, pepper spray. This isn't just, like, the kind of thing you or I could buy in the store. We were just gouging the crowd, and that included somebody who was disabled and couldn't move fast enough to get away, and another person who was carrying their young child who was just being coated in this pepper spray. And if you look up this footage, what you'll see is that the Black Rock activists, um, they start throwing empty plastic bottles at the police to distract them. Um, and while they do that, they rush in and they use their own bodies as human shields against this pepper spray, and they help this disabled person, and they help... Um, that, that child away. And actually one of the first people that's been convicted from the protest in January 20th 
is a young activist. I'm afraid I forget his name right now, but he was instrumental in rescuing this child and, and, and the child's parent. And, and so what we're seeing is that they're, he's being targeted for that. Um, and, and so, again, your anti-fascism isn't necessarily a unified movement. There's people of all political views that are, that are taking on that label and are, are sometimes, in some cases, dressing up all in black. But that also doesn't mean that anti-fascists are always doing dressed up in black either. We shouldn't confuse that again. It's just one tactic of dozens that you might use. Um, there's a really fascinating group in Scandinavia called the Lolgers of Odin, L-O-L, jurors, like soldiers but laughing. And they actually, there's a, a white supremacist group called the Soldiers of Odin. And so these guys come out dressed as clowns, um, like soldiers of Odin clowns. And so they're anti-fascist clowns that when this white supremacist group mobilizes, they come out and make them look ridiculous, like, oh, you're all a bunch of clowns because here we are out clowning with you. Um, so, you know, again, I want to emphasize that anti-fascism can look all different ways, too. It's not always these people dressed in black. Yeah, that would be quite the scene, seeing these, you know, if you were on psychedelics watching that scene from like a... <laughs> From like a five-story building. I mean, that would be like a an, an apop- apocalyptic type situation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you think that um, you know some of these black bloc anarchists um, that you know have broken, smashed windows of just random coffee shops or whatever have given groups like Antifa. And when I say Antifa, I'm trying to not go like full NPR, you know, Antifa. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I'm really kind of weird about saying the word, but, um, you know, have they given Antifa the uh, a, a bad name, in a sense? Have they given Antifa a bad reputation? You know, I think I'm more concerned, honestly, in this country that... that we are so obsessed with property in this country that a few acts of property destruction can, in some people's minds, outweigh what is being done or what the white supremacists are doing. You know, because this, this media attack on anti-fascism is coming, what, like three weeks, maybe not, maybe a month since somebody was run down with a car, you know, and, and Nazis were surrounding a black church with torches. You know, those are terrifying images of our past that we're reliving in 2015. And there's all this focus on that. And, and, you know, I don't feel it's my place to judge every single anti-fascist activist and what they do in the moment. Some of them do believe that these acts of property destruction send a message about the links between late-stage capitalism and fascism. That's not something, I, you know, my primary work as an anti-fascist is educational. I teach classes. But... You know, I think there's a, we need to respect the diversity of tactics and we need to focus more on what's happening on the people that the anti-fascists are fighting. And that's not what the media is doing right now. There's been thousands of words devoted to whether or not people fighting Nazis are the same as Nazis. And not those many words by, devoted to the fact that we kind of have a Nazi uprising in our country, that they're marching with torches in our country. Um, I do think there's something to say about the word, though, Antifa. You know, that's a word that's existed for decades in Europe. And if I was in France and I told somebody, hey, I'm part of an Antifa soccer club, most people there would know what that means. But here it's a relatively new word. And a lot of people don't realize when they hear it that all it means is anti-fascist. And most people out there aren't pro-fascist. But when they hear the media talking about these scary people in black, you know, that certainly doesn't benefit anti-fascism. And so I've been trying to emphasize whenever I use that word, Antifa, I, I try to just expand it and say, anti-fascist, because that's really what we're talking about. And, and, you know, yes, there's a place to debate tactics and whether and when to use different tactics as anti-fascist, but overall, we should all be supportive of anti-fascism as a whole, because none of us wants these kinds of groups to grow in numbers and power in our country. Imagine your 1999 self being told... (laughs) that anti-fascist clowns were fighting Nazis in the streets that support President Donald Trump. Like, how insane. Well, you'd be like, Are you, that's not real. That's not even possible. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you have to go back to five years ago, Jake. I mean, me, like, me from five years ago would just be, would be flabbergasted by this, you know? Like, it, it, 
the, the, t- the time we were living in during Occupy seemed completely different than this, the things we were dealing with. Even when we were dealing with, you know, like when uh, conservatives and right-wingers would come into an Occupy camp, it was always with, you know, a, even a certain amount of curiosity, even if they were also hostile. Nowadays, they'd be coming in with guns drawn, probably. It's ridiculous how much it's changed in just a few years. Yeah, we've reached a, a terminal stage of surrealism. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're... we're I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm afraid that, you know. I. I think it's only going to get weirder. I don't. I don't see. I don't see it getting. I. I don't know how it's going to get any better. You know. I don't see well, it. Okay. Go on, kid. Sorry. Oh uh, no! I was just going to jump in because you know, as a Gonzo journalist, my sort of patron saint is Hunter S. Thompson, and he famously said. When the going gets weird, the weird turn pro, and so that's what I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the truth. But, uh, Kit, thanks again for coming on the show today. Uh, everyone, go to kitoconnell.com. Support Kit. Become a patron of Kit's because he does fantastic work. I mean, we, we just discussed three very important subjects, and they're all on kitoconnell.com. You also get special goodies by becoming a patron of Kits. You know, he doesn't leave you uh, without, for sure, with a, uh, a couple buckets, a couple uh, bucks dropped in his bucket. But uh, thank, thanks again, Kit, for coming on. It's always a pleasure. I'll talk to you next month. All right, talk to you, Kit. And that was another edition with KitOConnell.com. Well, no. I mean, KitOConnell.com is not a person. That was with Kit O'Connell of KitOConnell.com. So we will be right back with Turd Ferguson of TFMetalsReport.com with our Economics and Precious Metals Report. So stay tuned for that. We will be right back. <laughs> 